boy. In fact, it must be almost to the day, a yeah. year ago. And um, uh, where I've gone with the preparation for this, for this talk uh, means that I probably should have given a talk about my first year in St. Leonard's, to be honest with you, because I, I think it would be more, more, uh, more interesting. Um, I'm not, I don't conform to any acronym that you might have made up about people coming to town, by the way, but um, I have been here a year, and it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, so what am I going to talk to you? There's a clicker to? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> you got it? Yeah, the four. There we go. Okay, so um, last year, this time last year, I spoke about an <coughs> idea, I love ideas, and the idea I spoke about was the cobra effect, uh, which is basically around the idea of uh, beware of unintended consequences. Um, since then, I've written an article by HIP about the, the um, dangers of getting too caught up in the relationship between uh, correlation and causation. Uh, disentangling causal chains. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk about flip back. Um, we won't play nature to your culture. Now it's not just about the, the old idea about you know nurture versus nature, although that's a part of it. Um, it started some time ago and it's part of a project. So basically I'm a veteran of too many years teaching and I used to teach a, the a course called Theory of Knowledge, part of the IB Baccalaureate. Anyone heard of that? So it's a core, part of the core of the Ivy uh, Diploma is Theory of Knowledge. And I love it, I taught it for 12 years, it's the best subject in the world. Very difficult, no content, it's all about how we come to know things. How we come to know things if we think like a historian, how we come to know things if we think like a scientist. When is it best to think like a scientist and when is it best to think like a historian or an artist or, or a, natural, uh, a human scientist. Uh, but I kind of thought there was something missing really. And I, I basically, very intimately working on a project where I'm accruing about 30, 25, 30 ideas that I think are kind of useful, uh, predominantly for young people just at undergraduate level, uh, that are these things. They're useful ideas, they're not just ideas that give you a buzz, but you can't actually use them, you can actually apply them. <coughs> they're transdisciplinary by very nature, they don't just sort of reside in science or in the arts, they sort of cross the piece. Uh, they're uncontested. No one can say that idea is, just doesn't exist. It's nothing you've made it up. You know, they, they are ideas that you can't refuse. They're neutral. They're, they're, that's a high claim, but they, uh, by and large, are trying to use ideas that basically don't afford one particular group who have vested interests an advantage. Uh, they really matter. They're really, really important. And um, I didn't put that word in because I love it. I said that last time. The thing. When I found out about these ideas, most of the time, I had a little twinge of epiphany. I love it. And they're unforgettable. So, uh, scroll back many, many years. I was an undergraduate fine artist. I came across the work of Barbara Kruger. Anyone know Barbara Kruger? There must be a few in. She, she was an artist. Um, well, she's still, still, she's a contemporary artist. But when I first came across her in the uh, early 80s, she was um, uh, just, I think, just a few years before that. Um, left the world of commercial art and began to apply the skills she learned in commercial art to more provocative political um, uh, pieces of work. This is a piece of work, normally wouldn't have Barbara Kruger on it, this is the cover of a book, but, but the kind of talk is about the work playing nature to your culture. And my premise is, the idea, the core of the idea is that there are times in your life in all spheres, when you're watching an advert, when you listen to a part of a political broadcast or whatever, where people will tell you or try and convince you that something is natural when it's in fact cultural. And there'll be other times when people try to take stuff and say, well, it's pure culture, but it's probably got a little bit of nature in there. Now, the more I've looked at this subject, the more I've kind of span out. And where I am now and what I'm thinking now is I kind of don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, I don't know what I think about this subject until I hear what I've got to say about it, really. Because the more research I've done into it um, in the weeks leading up to this, the more I realise that the centre hasn't really held and I have nothing to say really about so It's not going to be a conclusive talk, there's certainly not many facts in it. Um, it's just a series of questions about the relationship between nature and culture. Um, so Barbara Google's work was a spark. I really remember the first time I saw that work all those decades ago. And then there was this as well, this film, The Phantom of Liberty, which is a wonderful film by Louis Brunwell, who's a surrealist filmmaker. And one of the scenes, there's many different, some somewhat disassociating scenes within the film, is, is a wonderful one where there's a dinner party in a bourgeois household in France, and uh, as the guests come in, 
they, they sit down at the dinner table. And um, it's, it's really wonderful because they, as you can see, they take their trousers down, they lift their skirts, whatever, and they sit on, on toilets, communally defecating together. It's a wonderful film, it's a good, good family one, good one for the grandsons. <laughs> and, um, and it's wonderful. And then, I think they have a conversation about um, water pollution in local rivers and what have you. It's very sedate and it's as, if, it's as if this is what we do all the time. And it really switched the switch for me because it made me realise that, well, it didn't make me realise, I don't want to make any big knowledge claim about this, it made me think that, well, maybe culture could have been so different. It's not the only way we could do things. Why do we defecate in private and eat communally? Anyway, five minutes into the scene, one of the protagonists leaves gets hungry, so he, he goes into a little room and on his own, very privately. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I thought, and I still think this is absolutely wonderful, this idea that, well, maybe there's loads of things we do which are completely nonsensical and rather arbitrary. In fact, I'm um, dressed in a certain way, it might be down to some really, you know, causal change that I've got no idea about. It's certainly not natural. It's, it's, it's natural, and I think he did a very good job in actually making me think a bit differently about this whole idea. There are two, of course, values in port. Nature um, means different things to different people. And I think there's two sort of strands that go through what I want to say to that. One is the actual, how do we make it a decisive sort of line between what is natural and what is cultural. But also, there's this other thing about the stuff that we do things every day, we behave in certain ways, we have certain attitudes, we hold certain values, which we think are kind of common sense, but they're, but they're not really that common sense. They are path dependent. I used this slide a year ago today. Um, I don't know if you know the, the term path dependence. That's another one of the ideas I think is really important. And the uh, word keyboard is kind of natural, isn't it? We all think, well, we do a computer, let's design everything else, let's leave the typewriter, rather the keyboard, alone. That's set in stone. But the, uh, the QWERTY keyboard, some historians of technology would tell us, um, was designed to slow typists down because the keyboard used to be a typewriter and hammers were jamming and people got too fast. The hammers that actually you know, delivered the text to the paper via the ribbon. So they tried to slow people down. But now we've got MacBook Airs and they still use the same thing. So they're just trying to give you an insight to the idea of path dependence. Another one that's always, always, I love this totally. Um, for years and years and years we put wing mirrors on the wings of cars, and no one questioned it. Can you imagine having to look into a little tiny rectangle of a mirror right at the end of your wing to see whether your, of course, rays were different than the, uh, the weight of cars was as big as it is today. And then it's one day someone said, well, I wonder, why don't we put them up on the door so that there's a massive image there, we can just glance at them. And I think that's a, a, an example of, um, of path dependence. So nature. Surely, one argument goes, everything that, that exists in the, in the biosphere is natural. You know, um, the MacBook that I was uh, fastidiously working on this on today all day, um, even though it looks unnatural, it, you know, it's made of rare minerals and, and, and rare metals that are forged from the earth, the electricity that pounds around it is a naturally occurring phenomenon. Some people draw the line, where do you draw the line though, between Technology and nature. Surely, to restate it, you know, everything in the biosphere is natural. It has to be good, doesn't it? Um, another one of the ideas is language judges. You know, um, so all I, I mean by this slide is that you know, we're talking about the relationship between nature and culture. We need to know what we mean by nature, what we mean by culture. We can't. I can't really. I don't really have the time to go into that. And I just flung this in here today. This is. Uh, I was going to put a picture of me. It's Hong Kong. With the, I've been doing for many years. This guy on the left is um, a banker, and the woman on the right is a domestic helper. Um, the banker from, is from the UK, and the uh, domestic helper, she's from the Philippines. The one on the left is called an expat, the one on the right is called a migrant worker. Um, so, just to restate that, you know, this be, my thesis is the idea that we need to understand and at least be aware that what is being proposed is being natural, what is being proposed is cultural, the language is going to be a barrier. It is really going to be a barrier. Just a slide about nature and culture. It's nice to get a weekend walk, isn't it, out in nature, but, you know, I would argue that this is, uh, is very unnatural. 
And uh, again, I'll just use it to illustrate the idea that sometimes we think we're looking at nature, but we're not. I mean, obviously, this is, you can route this right back to the Enclosures Act, and I forgot the date that that came in there. Uh, it, it has some nature in it, and I'm going to work towards the sort of idea that, just like so many things now, this is not binary. It's just not binary. There isn't this thing over there called culture, and this thing over there called nature. But certainly, when we go through there, think we need to get out of nature, we're not really. This is historically driven. Uh, and it's, it, it's about agriculture, more of which later. Uh, I just put this in this photograph I took on a lovely walk out in nature a couple of weeks ago on the South Downs. And uh, it's scary, the mono monocrops or whatever you want to call it, uh, the, 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 uh, much of our so called nature has been reduced to monocrops. Uh, we know that ne this isn't nature at all because nature is diverse. Um, there's a great book called Mark Biomimicry where there's a little group of people that are trying to say that agriculture like this is bad, I'm sure you understand the issues. Um, in nature, biodiversity in, in, in terms of crops being grown next to each other, in and, among, in and amongst each other, different species, some that harvest at certain times. Obviously it puts a weight of labour and, and harvest uh, technology, but it is, is, is much better, it's much more natural in a sense. Same as the Highlands, another great picture of pure nature, eh? But um, it wasn't that long ago when this would have been covered in forests, at least to a certain level of altitude. Um, and the, the, you know, the jury's out on this one. There is some climatic change which has brought about deforestation in the Highlands, and a, some of the land has um, gone into being more peat bog. Um, but but the, the prime the prime reason why the, the Highlands are there now, and indeed lots of lots of other areas in the UK, is because. Um, uh, deforestation due to shipbuilding, charcoal, and um, the, the Highland clearances and the, and the, and the mass of the implementation of sheep farm. But this isn't nature. This isn't nature. First graph there on the left of a weaver bird making its nest. I think it's a weaver bird. It's about to be And then an artist's work on the right. Which is natural, which is cultural? Are they both the same? And why does it matter, I suppose? And the more I've prepared for this, the more I've realised that, you know, is it the wrong question? Is it the wrong question? <laughs> Some examples then. Hey, and um, um, is eating meat natural or cultural? I mean, there, is, there is, seems to be a lot of um, evidence, scientific evidence to suggest that, you know, our guts aren't designed to eat meat. Uh, people say we've got canines. Canine teeth, but certainly gorillas have got canine teeth as well. They've got really good canine teeth. Uh, I think it's interesting, but when does it become interesting? It, you know, you like me are probably a little bit tired of the vociferous vegans that are telling you that you know, you've got to give up. It's not natural to eat meat. And then the, the other people might say, well, we're omnivores, but we've become omnivores. But where, when did we cross the line between nature and culture? Or indeed, did we? It doesn't matter. Okay, gender roles. Someone had to test the subject, and there you go. Um, they're natural, right? They're, na they're natural. G gender roles are natural. This is, this is a huge issue at the moment. Some people, some like, big talking heads coming out of the woodwork and saying that no, there are fundamental difference, differences between men and women. You know, and and at, at the really bottom of it all, there are really, you know, not just in terms of biology, but in terms of dispositions. Um, I was hoping for someone to shout out something there, but there you go. Um, but there are some theories too, which are some kind of bullet points of my brain. Um, so the Neolithic uh, Revolution, um, the Agrarian Revolution, but it but kind of gets mixed up with one that was 200 years ago. So the Neolithic Revolution was like 13,000 years ago. It's when hunter gatherers, foragers started to settle. <coughs> And they started to stay in one place. They started to cultivate the land. Um, and some people believe um, that this was the start of a real sort of quite radical reappraisal and, and uh, implementation of this kind of patriarchal and, and, and system we have now and gender roles that we have now. It's, if they're not natural. They are. These people would argue there, is, there are some counter arguments to other that it was the uh, the move from being hunter gatherers to being Agricultural um, workers, so, you know what I mean. 
So there's uh, a really good article written by, read quite recently about the idea of the hoe, uh, the hoe, people who used to hoe back 13, 14,000 years ago, and those that used to plow. And the argument goes like this, that those people that developed a new piece of technology called plow, um, it became more difficult, and this is going to be controversial, for, um, or it's easier rather, for men to use the plows because it involved a lot more upper body strength. Um, it was dangerous for small children to be around it. Um, and so then we began the partition, so some people say, between women that were more likely to stay at home and men that were more likely to be out and about and working very hard um, all day. Um, also, as humans began to settle on land and claim land, the whole concept of property, um, it became more important to be able to trace your bloodline so you could pass that land onto your progeny. And so that's when monogamy really started to hit in. Prior to that, some would say that monogamy was not a natural way of organising your life. And also, as, as people settled and they had surplus food, and going back to that issue about um, meat eating, was an adaptive advantage for humans because it meant they could store food, they could cook it quickly, it lasted longer, they could store calories, and so it began, it, it, it meant that they had an advantage, they weren't forever foraging and what have you. Not so much eating meat, cooking meat, right? And of course, the birth rate went up after the agrarian revolution, there was more set, people were more settled, and so birth rate went up, and birth rate went up, of course, you needed something to look after children. This would be very simplistic, but the men were out for the plow. <laughs> doing the hard labour, and this is this is how it came about. Um, that really, really summary explanation of how his technology can actually uh, bring about gender roles that some would argue are natural, um, probably insufficient for data. Um, food as well. Um, these slides should have been a bit earlier. I realise now. This this idea of natural in, in, in you buy your food. Everyone wants natural food, right? But the, if you examine and drill down with some of the statistics of this, what is actually Allowed to be brown as natural is um, not really natural at all by some estimation. Um, this video is absolutely wonderful. You know, he, he argues that you wouldn't want to buy wheat crackers that are only partially made up of natural stuff. He talks at great length about, you know, stick a barn on it and everyone will buy it. Okay, so um, we're getting near to social Darwinism now. And this is really, really quite core of it for me. Um, there's a lot of fallacies, right? We're all, we're all prone to them. The uh, naturalistic fallacy is a great one, and that goes, it's, it, it goes like, I think if you study philosophy, it goes like something that is, so then it goes to something which ought to be the case. And so the naturalistic fallacy is like, well, it happens in nature, so it must be good, or we must do it. Yeah? This is part of, again, about the accusations that some people make about things being natural, not culture. And the opposite of that, which I think is great, is a moralistic fallacy where it goes the other, other way around. That everyone should be equal or whatever, or everyone is the same, or this is good practice not to kill people, therefore everyone must be like that. Uh, that sort of, uh, fallacy is a bit, you know, it doesn't follow really, it doesn't really follow because otherwise we might want to eat our male spouse up. If you're a black widow spider, it happens in nature, we might as well do that, I think. And if you're a lion, if you're taking over a, 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 an adopted family, blended family, you, you kill and eat the progeny of that family. So the, the naturalistic colour is really, really a poor model. It happens all the time. We know, without going into detail, politicians telling us it's unnatural. It's unnatural. You just can't do it. it, it and the, and the, the halo around something, which you can, if you can convince someone that's natural, there's a halo. Where do you go from there? So here's a bit about social Darwinism. And, and, that, and the kind of social Darwinist viewpoint is uh, pernicious, I think hopefully you all agree, but also it's, it's predicated on the naturalistic fallacy and Darwinism, but I don't think Darwin would go near it really. I think his, his ideas were appropriate. So social Darwinism goes like Back in the 19th century, um, survival of the fittest, easy concept to understand. So that happens in nature, so it must happen in the way we organise our social structures. And it was basically an idea used to support capitalism, support the, uh, the exploitation of those with um, little power, little capital. 
So a good example of when something is kind of promoted as natural when it's in fact not only cultural but um, is, is really political. So what? So what? Don't take pictures of your thoughts in nature. Simple. Be aware that the way things are is not the only way they, the way they can be. Uh, and question authority if it's not authoritative. Um, always ask why and look for cause of change and the roots of things and ask whose purpose is being served by any decision, convention, knowledge or tradition. And don't let culture, convention or common sense define you, you or your reality. Another thing so what, this thing I haven't really planned for is, I think this is quite interesting in that sense in the same sense I've been talking, is you, you know about this, um, the reforms being pushed by certain groups at the moment about uh, transgender rights and the, uh, the incoming views from LGBT groups and what have you, and all these groups. Um, I think there's going to be, as this pans out goes further, there's going to be a lot, a lot of discussion about the relationship to culture and nature, and uh, uh, whether transgender people actually are naturally person they transition to, gender they transition to, or whether it's culture. <coughs> and I think that discussion is right at the core. Um, this idea of nature, don't play nature to your culture, is right at the core of this debate. It's, just, it's very, much, very much in our minds at the moment. Thank you. Right. Any, uh, thank you, Gareth. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Any questions for Gareth about uh, black widow spiders uh, or anything social Darwinistic? Uh, any any burning questions? Yes, a waving hand. I'm going to come running over to you. Here we go. Hello. Hiya. I've got a question about one of your slides. <coughs> you use the word man instead of humans. Why would you do that? Um. <laughs> That's bullshit. Acculturation. In this day and age, that's, that's unforgivable. Okay. <laughs> any, any other... It's oh, unforgivable. <laughs> any, any other questions? Any, any other questions for Gareth uh, before we take a break and move on? The, uh, any other questions? If we have no more questions, then... Can we thank Gareth for a wonderful... <laughs>